Welcome to Stonefront for Art and Architecture. The public is in bites and pieces. We are going to start outside with a performance that introduces us into the space of a book that is presented today to the public. We have with all of us Francisca Benitez. to see all, all of you here. Our performance has elements of deaf poetry, political chant, and storytelling. We're going to sign it and we're not going to voice interpret it. That's why we're doing a little in, in, uh, introduction now. And we're going to help you a little bit with some clues. Okay, it's very visual. We're going to help you with these clues, okay? We're going to give you some signs so you're not so lost. Trump. Tweeting shit. <laughs> Wall. Immigration. Military expansion. Conflicts of interest. Women's rights. LGBTQ. Black Lives Matter. Indigenous communities, indigenous lands. The environment and earth. Okay, so get an idea. Now, we're going to teach you the chant part. So maybe you can join us. Yeah. So the chant is very simple. It, the chant is recurrent. So it has like, it's like a song with a choir. So we're going to teach you the chant. With the handshake B. Here you go, handshake B. <laughs> big head, meaning big head, big shot. Me, 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 me. Talk, talk, talk. Lies, lies, lies. So that's a chant part.
this performance to the great Vito Aconchi.
until 8.30 or something? Yeah. Is it possible to leave? Yeah. You can find a seat that can go in to make it easy for you. How are you? These are nice benches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, careful the camera. Yeah. Just Be careful with the camera. Yeah. It allows for... <laughs> they're really nice though. <laughs> well, I mean, we got for, the... the pl for plastic, they're good. Yeah. For plastic, they are pretty fine. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a seat. You, you're sitting there, huh? No, no, no. But no? We have some, some of the participants sitting in this round, actually. Yeah. I can move back. You want to sit up front? Um, no, 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 no. Um, I, I can sit here. You're good. You're good. Can I work back there? Yeah, you can take that and move it here. Get the one Just let me know. Can I get some? you can no, no. So over, over there, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's your seat. That's your seat. That's your seat. Because you're going to talk. <laughs> please, please. Please, please. I know, I know, but some of, some of us are us sitting yeah. here. Well, yeah, and what uh, what is going to change? No? I'm close to Eva. Okay, that's also fine. <laughs> no? Okay, do you want to fix it? Yo, la idea era sentarme allá. Em pots passar aquest, aquest seia? Ah. Yeah. Actually, I need to be over here. Like, you can, like, if, if you want to sit here? No, no, no. I mean, yeah, Carlos, do you want me to squeeze over here? And what about yeah. you? What? I think it's good if you circulate the book from here, no? If I, if I, and hand it around? One. Yeah, I'll go get one. Um, people. Thank you, everyone. With this prelude of a real cabaret, we are going to proceed with a less performative and yet probably not less spectacular form of engagement. Um, I am Eva Frank, I'm the director of the Storefront for Art and Architecture. And over the last six years, I've had the, the privilege and, and the virtue to be able to actually uh, engage with the legacy of an institution that over the last 35 years has been trying to produce spaces for alternative discourse. Um, at the edge of any disciplinary label that society has produced, this institution has constantly tried to redefine that what it means to exist in the cultural landscape in New York City and around the world, always trying to think how do we build human edifices, civic edifices, from cities to collective forms. This institution in 1994 brought two individuals together, Stephen Hall and Vito Conchi, in the production of an adventure that would transform those two people for the rest of their lives. I had the privilege over the years to engage with both of them in a series of conversations Vito last week left us in a moment that was always too soon. Vito was someone that made each one of us become poets just even by talking to him. He managed to bring an essential part of all of us that is the radical child and visionary that constantly tries to redefine who we are and where we are going. We are trying to figure out what is the best time and the best place and the best way to honor someone who probably will show up if we try to do a memorial and a canonical in any canonical form. I interviewed him on, on December 9th, was in his studio, and I was just rereading the tape. And it was really interesting because we we're going through his to-do list and his shopping list. He said that he loved ice cream of chocolate cookie top. So maybe the best way we can do to celebrate is not to keep a minute of silence where the city will speak louder than his voice, but all of us to go and buy a piece of ice cream and chocolate dog and follow someone through the streets and come back with a fire truck or with that and, um, and honor Vito in a way that, that would honor his legacy 
of constantly redefining life, art, and obviously architecture. So with that said, I just want to thank all of you for being here, um, for um, producing yet again another space of encounter where there is uh, an audience and yet there is a um, stage that is not the stage, that the stage becomes the street. And in that space of performance and discussion, I do hope that we find the time to really ask questions back and forth. Um, the Cabaret series was produced as a way to try to open up, Whoa. Yes. as a way to try to open up established formats like book lunches. And so this is not a book lunch, and yet it is a book lunch. This is not a cabaret series, but it is a cabaret series. And this is not just a place where friends and colleagues meet, but this is just a place where friends and colleagues meet and are made. So with that said, I want to thank all the speakers and contributors that tonight have accepted to be part of this adventure. I want to thank Carlos for really putting uh, uh, this thing together with the team at, at MIT. And I'm going to simply ask you to welcome um, Gedeminias Urbonas into this microphone that is not working, but into this space where the voice is definitely transpiring through the room. Thank you so much, and thank you for having us here. Hi everyone. This uh, one's working. Uh, Why don't you use the one that works? Okay. Hi everyone. Is it working? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Gediminas Rubonas. I am artist and director of MIT program in art, culture, and technology. And I'm very pleased to see uh, many familiar and many unfamiliar names here tonight. <coughs> Um, I want to thank uh, you all coming and Johnny for this book launch and also Eva and Storyfront oh, and Storyfront team uh, for hosting this event. Uh, uh, the book uh, Public Space Lost and Found uh, was prompted by the symposium with the same name that happened at MIT in 2000. <laughs> it's really difficult for me to call Paul. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but I'm glad to see that the cover matches the seats uh, of this uh, space that was shrunk. I just learned that uh, public space is shrinking, should be uh, reformulated, that this public space has been shrunk by someone. So, uh, in 2014, we convened for the symposium with the same name, Public Space Lost and Found. Um, that was uh, put together uh, with the effort to uh, look into the lineage of the pedagogy engaging uh, public space uh, through the years uh, uh, at MIT. Uh, it was coinciding uh, with the retirement of Professor Montadas, uh, but it was also looking into the history of that started 50 years ago, in fact, in 67, when Georgi Kepes uh, founded the Center for Advanced Visual Studies uh, and, uh, and pushed uh, something that is called art on civic and environmental scale. So, so these two scales uh, are representing very important lineage of research and pedagogy at MIT at this uh, small uh, program uh, that's been existing for 50 years. Uh, in the institute that is uh, namely known for technologies, for military technologies, right? So the critical, uh, small critical program has been uh, doing uh, big work uh, 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 in terms of uh, pushing something what we are calling double agency of art. Uh, so um, in 2014 with the symposium, uh, we also came up with the exhibition that uh, encapsulated uh, works uh, of the last 15 years, starting from 99. Um, and I'm happy to see also here uh, Dennis Adams, uh, who was uh, director of visual art program uh, at the time, um, and Anthony Montadas, who started to teach course uh, at one studio in uh, art and uh, public space. So the works uh, that were coming from the studio uh, were put together uh, in the format of exhibition at MIT. Um, and, um, and the dialogues that took place in the spring, in the symposium and in the exhibition, uh, uh, prompted, uh, prompted larger discussion uh, that uh, was also uh, 
register it and also add it with the special contributions uh, that uh, you can trace in this book and through its four chapters. Uh, uh, paradoxes, jurisdictions, uh, signals, and ecologies. Uh, so uh, the book, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, is has a cut cover, right? <laughs> and, uh, it is for sale. And, uh, and it took time to produce. Uh, and I wanted to, first of all, thank uh, the editorial team and Louis, uh, professor at uh, uh, Chicago at Institute, and Lucas Freeman, uh, who is also here, who is writing residence uh, at ACT. Uh, uh, without uh, your help, of course, this book would not be possible. Uh, I also want to thank uh, contributors, uh, Professor Lucadas and Dennis Adams, uh, Jill Maggett, who is uh, alumni from the program, um, and many others um, who uh, stayed with us throughout the process, uh, and especially during this last month. Uh, so the book, the book just you know just was printed and sent overnight uh, with UPS. I don't know how they managed to send it overnight from Lithuania, where it was printed. Um, um, so, of course, uh, thanking my team, I should also thank uh, and also Patsy, uh, who helped a lot with editing, uh, and, uh, and also Mighty Press for distributing. Uh, you can uh, acquire this book here at Storyfront, uh, starting from today. We will have another launch in Venice uh, next Thursday at Venice Biennial. Um, I should also mention uh, designers, North Berlin, Oslo, uh, with whom we have history collaborating for the last uh, 10 years, and uh, starting with the project of Venice Biennial 2007, and most recently uh, is the special collections uh, of CABS uh, that we are launching uh, later this summer, uh, in, in June, so you're all very welcome to uh, to proceed with this better testing version uh, and respond. Uh, so the special collection of CBS, in fact, is hosting uh, several collections, including Muriel Cooper and uh, Vision and Values series by Kepesh. Uh, and this book, through its design, also alludes to the format uh, of Vision and Value uh, uh, that was edited by Kepesh and. Uh, uh, not only uh, uh, in terms of the hardcover that Dennis uh, mentioned, you know, but, uh, but uh, primarily uh, uh, as it brings uh, imagery uh, that looks, uh, uh, in vision value, it looks into the construction of the new image that comes from the science labs. Uh, but today, uh, for us, it is also important to bring the new image that comes from, uh, from the social and political life. So I think this, uh, these images uh, and, uh, and the text and the discourses you can find in this work speaks to that effort. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, people with whose support this book would not be possible. Uh, and uh, first of all, Cynthia and John Reed Foundation. Uh, also, furthermore, Kaplan Fund, uh, Media phone. I think I mentioned UPS, who shipped the book uh, in time. Uh, they're very happy about this support as well. Um, and, um, and others. Um, well, uh, maybe uh, to, to end, uh, uh, I should say that this book comes in the very important time uh, for all of us. Um, uh, not only, as, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the public space has been shrank, but uh, but it is coming in the time when we are uh, learning uh, uh, those who are in academia and those who are not in academia. We all learning forms of resistance, um, and we learning um, of the role of aesthetics and art uh, in this uh, process of resistance. I hope that uh, practices and uh, and the theories uh, that are uh, registered in this volume uh, you find uh, inspiring. And, um, and uh, also I hope that this adds uh, to the constant, uh, constant struggle 
that we all of us have to engage as artists, as architects, and as thinkers. Thank you all. Working? Good. Okay. Um, I'll talk close to the mic. Reduce the game. Uh, hi, my name is Colby Chamberlain. I contributed to the volume of text uh, on the work of Jill Maggot. Right here. Uh, pressuring this word public, uh, which I'm going to continue to do here, um, but less in dialogue with Jill uh, and more in dialogue with someone else. Uh, you can see the screens wherever they may be. Please do follow along. John Cage. John, you composed your diary for world improvement on an IBM Selectric typewriter. Chance operations determine the typefaces and the length of each day's entry. I prepared this with Keynote, Photoshop, and Word. Saved it to Dropbox, forwarded it by Gmail. Consider this then a seance through electronic services. My Mac to your IBM, devices communicating across time. I'm trying to reach you. Page. April, John Cage. April 1964, U.S. State Department man gave Honolulu talk. Global Village, whether we like it or not, cited 55 services which are global in extent. Talk of services catches your interest. Telephone, gas, electricity, plumbing, beneath the cobblestones, the pipes. You heard it from the State Department and McLuhan, you want to know more. You make calls, send telegrams, write letters. You need details. You want numbers. When I said 55 global services, California Bell telephone man replied, September 65, it's now 61. This excites you, doesn't it, John? But why? Percussion, chance, silence, indeterminacy, theater, and now in the 60s, this technocratic babble about utilities. You've jumped from the concert hall to the whole globe, passing over the city, the region, the nation. Marshall and Buckminster have sold you on a vision of services ameliorating social problems, reducing competition, dissolving politics. The image of a globe divided by borders gives way to one enmeshed in cables, pipes, and wires. Kluver reports, ITA, International Telecommunication Union, was established in 1865, nine years older than UPU, post, and 17 older than railroad agreements. Billy Kluver has his facts straight, John. It's true, standardization of telegraphic communication precedes other international agreements, but that history is partial. The first cross-continental communication networks were much earlier. They were forged by empire. The Roman cursus public consisted of courier routes employed by the emperor and his representatives. These routes were public, only insofar as they excluded private individuals. They were instruments of rule. Wanting list of current global services. How will I get it? Long, costly correspondences? Pentagon advises telephoning. I'll write to the President of the US, to the Secretary of State of the US. Time passing, I'll ask those I encounter whether they have any information. McLuhan had not any. I'll write to Fuller. Should have done that in the first place. Pope Paul, Lindsay, take note. Why are you talking to the Pentagon? John, the irony, don't you see? Those public courier routes, they opened up to private correspondence in the early 17th century, becoming what we now call the Postal Service. 
that in no way reversed their original purpose. They had just developed a new subroutine for processing individuals. A public service answers to the interests of the state. Books one formerly needed were hard to locate. <coughs> no, now they're all out in paperback. Society's changing. Relevant information's hard to come by. Soon it will be everywhere, unnoticed. I know, John, I know how non-Habermasian of me, but John, neither are you. All that circulation of letters, pamphlets, and papers in the 18th century, was that really the bourgeoisie gaining a voice in their own governance? With the mail, the post office, it's also familiar, quaint, we can't see it anymore, but in the information economy, with browser search histories and GPS trackers, we see it anew. What do you hear when I say the word public? Does a service that's public empower subjects or ensnare them? Advertising's discredited itself. When they advertise something, we avoid it. John, John, you taught us so much about opening our ears, our eyes, about letting sounds be sounds, about knowing that there will never be silence. But what happens when everything you taught us gets translated into marketing strategy? When our openness, curiosity, and intention become finite reserves that public utilities tap? What'll happen when intelligence is recognized as global resource, fuller? Political organizations giving up involvement with play, partners, opponents, involvement with unattainable goals, victories, truths, freedoms, will simply fade out of the picture. Image coming up is that of the utilities, gas, electricity, telephones, unquestionable, emotionally unarousing. I get where you're coming from, non-attachment, disinterestedness. John, you see your Zen ideals reflected in the implacable austerity of infrastructure. What emotions could a gas pipe channel? But John, John, politics won't wither away on the phone line. Ugly feelings won't just disperse. Opposition persists. Your dream of evacuation is someone else's opportunity for capture. Arts obscured the difference between art and life. Now let life obscure the difference between life and art. Fuller's life is art. Comprehensive design, science. Inventory of world resources. If enough mined copper exists, reuse, don't mine more. Same with ideas. World needs arranging. It'll be like living a painting by Johns. Stars and stripes will be utilities. Our daily lives, the brush strokes. I can't see freedom in that image, John. Not with Con Edison, Verizon, or Time Warner as stacks of red and white, or 311 as a, story, as a starry blue nor with myself, <coughs> nor with myself as some brush, brushstroke caught within them, sealed in wax. But maybe the image is accurate. Maybe from 1966, you're peering through my Mac into the present day and seeing the situation quite clearly. <coughs> Encaustic individuals held tight by utilities services sorting the unruly energies of a nation.
Hi. So nice to see so many of us are not at Freeze. Uh, <laughs> nice to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm a really big fan of this space um, and many people on this panel. So. Um, I'm going to read a thing and hopefully I don't bore you too much. Um, but throughout modern history, the shattered window has in various ways indexed social crises. Or in revolution leads to the dismantling of the crystalline boundaries between public and private property. From the Watts Rebellion, WTO, and GA protests to the 2011 London riots, Black Lives Matter protests, and the inauguration of Donald J. Trump, the shattered glass window repeatedly proves to be a site of counter identification with the systems of oppression under late capitalism. Learning from these events, how might we differently consider the act of window breaking beyond the well rehearsed understandings of protests, felony, and looting? and instead reframe it as an intersubjective form of resistance and disavowal. <clears throat> so glass is arguably one of the most abundant materials found within the global city, a surface that mediates vision in multiple forms from the shimmering curtain walls of luxury development to the handheld touchscreen devices of internet infrastructure. Glass permeates daily life as both a material to be looked through and looked at directly. While the global city is continually reproduced under an ever-generating transparent skin, these surfaces in fact create a spatial condition in which we're repeatedly confronted by our own reflections. But I'm interested in asking what role might such conditions of reflectivity play during times of extreme political unrest when the glass window repeatedly serves to be one of the first sites of uh, protests. Breaking the glass windows of urban architecture perhaps signals a certain demonstrative rejection of the globalized built environment. In this way, we might consider the way large plate glass might uphold civility and social norms. When considering the rampant per, uh, condition of privatization of public space that has led to the development of new enclosures and exclusionary commons, surely transparency carries a unique sort of regulating function and becomes the very epitome of social morality, and especially trust. That large exposed sheets of glass often remain unbroken until periods of dissent raises question about forms of trust, or as sociologist Pierre Bourdieu might term this, a habitus, the social made body. This form of trust is perhaps telling when considering the types of neighborhoods in which large plate glass first appears. Yet trust may become weaponized to forms of policing as well. So, for instance, as in the exemplary neoliberal rhetoric of George Kelling and James Q. Wilson's Broken Windows Theory, which advocated for command and control policing as a means of enforcing safety in the public space. Through an implied racist and ableist logic, Kelling and Wilson used the broken window as a signifier for larger questions of social decay and fear. In this way, we might also consider the way the display window actually carries a disciplining function. It's an architecture that, not unlike Jeremy Bethlehem's Panopticon, might become embodied. So, as an act of resistance and performance of dissent, the smashing of windows both literally and symbolically shatters the seemingly transparent yet deceptively opaque division of public and privatized space, opening access to the last vestiges of the commons, the city streets. So how might the breaking of glass point towards an aggressive object relation that crystallizes the often repressed forms of alienation and exclusion normalized under late capitalism? So I'm interested in asking how perhaps a psychoanalytic reading of the intersubjective relationship between subject and object, or in this case, window and window breaker, might be one useful way to rethink this recurrent condition of dissent away from the pathologizing rhetoric of criminality. The fallacy of transparency has long plagued modern architectural discourse, and I certainly don't need to attempt to uh, rehearse that here uh, at Storefront. Yet more than an invisible barrier, glass is a screen for projection, a material that always indexes its surrounding environment. Following Anthony Bidler, literal transparency is notoriously difficult to attain and quickly turns into reflectivity. Similarly, the artist Dan Graham has observed that glass used in display windows isolates the consumer from the product at the same time as it superimposes the mirror reflection of their own image onto the goods displayed. Recognizing this perceptual condition as producing both alienating and desirous effects, Graham goes on to observe that the individual is made to identify themselves with the image of the commodity so that the commodity object becomes a substitute fetish for their lack. Certainly, the Lacan, who observed the formation of the eye in relation to one's reflection as an identification of the full sense analysis gives to the term, or what he called the mirror stage, is an essential precedent for both Vidler and Graben's observations. 
Yet perhaps it is through the work of object relations theorist and psychoanalyst Melanie Klein that we might rethink the very object relations at play between the public and its collector reflection in the storefront window. In a brief passage in her seminal 1946 essay, Notes on Some Schizoid Mechanisms, Klein introduces the concept of projective identification. Following Freud, Klein identified projection as a defense against anxiety, yet further developed this concept to include a process in which bad parts of the self are split off and redirected at an external object, resulting in an identification of an object with the hated parts of the self. Indeed, for Klein, there's an inherent narcissism in this process of expelling unwanted parts of the self onto another person. Yet, while Klein associated this process largely with psychotic disorders, and in particular infants, she observed that not only bad parts of the self were expelled, but good parts as well which becomes an essential process in developing healthy relationships and ego integration. If we are to explain Klein's model on a broader scale to include what might be called social object relations, how might we interpret images of window breaking as a collective process of projective identification? If we recall Wittler's observation of the way in which literal transparency is in fact reflective, what are we to make of the group subject's reflection in the constructed scene of the window frame? Through the shattering of the window, it is perhaps not only the resistance to capitalist ideology and structural violence that is rejected, but the way in which we are interpolated by this ideology, by the ways in which it internalized within us. Indeed, in reviewing images of protests and riots, it is clear that the public does not positively identify with its image reflected in the glass window. Following Klein, perhaps we might argue that this disavowal and splitting off of bad parts of the self are collectively unwanted as a result of bourgeois hegemony. Indeed, window breaking is often associated with the black bloc, groups known for wearing all black apparel as a means of concealing their identity. Yet what is curious about the black bloc is perhaps the uniform, non-individualized appearance the collective assumes, a form theorist and only after might call ethical militants, a political collectivity that seeks to supplant bourgeois individualism with a new notion of the group or ontological set. Following after, we might also consider this collective disavowal as an urgent act of striving for a better model of collectivity, a different constitution of the self. It seems worth noting, however, that what is suggested here is not an advocacy for forms of violence, but rather a different way of considering its intersubjective impulses as part of a collective struggle. Indeed, as after suggests, the point is not to hold radical thought accountable for allowing ethical militants to free fall into parliamentary terror, misrecognizing its own camouflage, as it were, but rather to see how ethical militants might be preserved, kept at a remove from terrorism, even when it comes to medically close to militarization. So, in wrapping up, um, in light of rising forms of global new conservatism, you know, think of rising forms of nationalism, there are sweeping in Europe and in the United States, um, it seems that uh, hegemonic forms of group subjectivity are upheld. Uh, and I'm advocating that ethical militancy seems increasingly urgent. Moreover, perhaps through the work of Melanie Klein, we might rethink the social object relations at play during times of political unrest. If Klein saw projective identification as the splitting off of bad parts of the self as an act of vital importance for normal development, then the breaking of windows not only signals an opposition, but perhaps also an attempt to foment an anti-bourgeois eagle ideal with the radical collective that is an impassioned attempt to create larger forms of social reparation through an expulsive act and a desire to get rid of the self. artwork that is making me think a lot about what public means and what public space means. So um, I'm going to try in these um, short minutes to catch you up roughly to 
to what I'm working on and where I am, and then I'll read you a very short piece that, um, that I wrote and just published a, a few days ago. Um, so I've been working for the last almost four years now on a project called the Berrigan Archives. Um, and the image that you see here was a political cartoon that was published um, maybe four months ago in relation to the project. It's a picture of um, the, the Mexican architect Luis Bedagon sticking his middle finger up wearing a diamond ring. And I will get to what that diamond ring refers to. Um, but the, the basic premise of the project is that I'm interested in artistic legacy who constructs, um, manipulates, access artistic legacy um, and how legacy is formed and the different institutions, foundations, and players that are involved in creating artistic legacy um, and a lot about access. So um, I was researching the Mexican architect, Luis Bedagon, who won the Pritzker Prize, lived from 1902 to 1988, and learned that his um, archive at the time of his death, he split it into a personal archive and a professional archive. The personal archive went to, stayed in Mexico City, where all of his work is, and his house and his professional archive was eventually bought by the Swiss furniture company, Vitra. Um, that after it bought the archive, also um, purchased the complete rights to the work, the copyrights, the intellectual property rights, and um, Bedagon's name sans, er sans accent. Um, so I became interested in what does it mean to own um, an artist's work and how can another artist access his work and, and um, make more work about that artist's work. So um, I got permission um, from, the, from Baragon's personal archive in Mexico to access it and make works, but I was not permitted to go to the professional archive at Vitra and was warned at the time um, that I couldn't have access, but that if I wanted to reproduce anything from the professional archive, there were potential legal consequences. So I made a series of works to show at Art in General in two, end of 2013, in which I used those legal constraints of copyright and intellectual property right as um, the constraints of the work. So I collaborated with lawyers, and I said, if I want to show, for instance, a photograph of Baragon's work, and I'm not allowed to, um, how can I get around that constraint? So for instance, what I did is I bought books published by Vitra with Bar pictures of Baragat's work in it and framed the photograph as like a ready-made with the rest of the book falling out of it. So the form itself interrogated the law and allowed the viewer to question why is it framed that way. So that was one of many examples. Um, the second part of the project involves this diamond ring that is in this political cartoon. Um, so a part of the story that I heard um, from many people um, was that the professional archive was bought by the um, director, the CEO of Vitra, for his then fiance, Federico Bizanco, as a wedding present. Um, I cannot say whether it's true or not, but I heard it many times also from the people who sold the archive to them. Um, but anyways, so um, I found that really interesting, the, the archive as wedding present. And um, I, uh, oh yeah, and I forgot to say that the other part of this, that same part of the story that I always heard was that it was sold as a wedding present in lieu of an engagement ring. And so I had this idea um, what if I could continue asking these questions about artistic legacy by reversing this legacy? What if Louis Bedagon were cremated and I could get access to his ashes and from his ashes make a diamond ring and propose to the CEO's wife, Avitra, the body converted into a diamond in exchange for the public access to the body of work? Um, that silly idea 
happened. Um, so Betagon was buried um, first in Guadalajara in his family's tomb, and eight years later he was reinterred in um, the National Monument in Guadalajara for um, most respected Mexican persons. Um, so I collaborated with his family, and his family requested to the Congress of Jalisco for a portion of the ashes, and after a couple of years it was approved. And um, in June of last year, I proposed to Federico Zanco at Vitra with a two carat diamond ring made completely out of the cremated remains of the architect Luis Um The New Yorker did a story about that piece in August. Um, I had had a few reviews about the work before that story broke. Um, in August in the New Yorker, and afterwards, it became extremely controversial um, in Mexico and in some ways in Switzerland. Um, so I just put up a show at MUAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Mexico City, it opened last week, Thursday night, and um, m there's probably 200 pages of debates right now maybe more, because there's like five a day, debating um, this, this ring. Um, and uh, kind of interestingly, it's just starting now, most of the debates are not about the questions about what the ring is posing, but are how on earth could this have happened? <laughs> not how did the archive get to Switzerland when all the work exists in Mexico, but how did permission happen and who in the government should lose their jobs. That's how it's become. So um, I hope I haven't gone about my seven minutes, but I pub uh, with Sternberg Press, I published this book, or they published this book about the work called The Proposal. And in a lot of news stories right now and in the newspapers, um, mainly in Mexico, they've used this book as a kind of witch hunt and um, circled every name that I mentioned and then went and researched and investigated everybody who, who approved the piece that I must stress was all done by legal means and with full permission of the family and all civic servants that were involved. So when I was asked to do the catalog for the show at MUAC, they said there's an acknowledgments page but I don't know, we don't know if you want to thank anyone because everyone you thank gets in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so I had um, an interesting um, um, situation there where I wanted to make acknowledgements but I didn't want to get anyone in trouble. And right before that I also have to say there was a um, ad taken out in the Reforma, uh, one of the major Mexican newspapers. Um, signed by 76 people, um, some of whom who had already written me emails to tell me how important the work was because they'd also been threatened by Vitra, but anyway, signed the letter, so I don't know what's happening, um, that, um, that the only thing that I could actually do with this ring that was ethical was to pulverize it and to reinsert it back into the tomb and basically stop this crazy thing that I'm pretending is an artwork. So, in response, I wrote a series of acknowledgments that I will end by reading here. Acknowledgments by Jill Maggot. Um, again, this is in the catalog of the show, so it refers to the show. I acknowledge that this exhibition and each of the works within it is indebted to others. I acknowledge that an artwork can also be a tool for negotiation. I acknowledge that artworks that question power or the status quo are valid proposals for a different way of living. I acknowledge that power is a set of relations that I can enter into with others. I acknowledge that art is synonymous, excuse me, I acknowledge that art is not synonymous with fiction and that scholarship is not synonymous with nonfiction. Both approaches are subjective. Both reveal different aspects of their subjects as well as the subjects who are studying them. I acknowledge that as the author of an artwork, I am responsible for it. 
I acknowledge that nonprofit foundations as recipients of tax and public money have a responsibility but to the public to make themselves and their holdings accessible. I acknowledge that a function of art institutions is to support and protect artists in their work and that to do so is their job. I acknowledge that making use of existing law and government protocol in the production of an artwork does not constitute a collaboration with either, but an enactment of them both. I acknowledge that making the law visible through artistic means is a way to interrogate it. I acknowledge that criminalizing institutions that support art or the art making process makes for a society that is intolerant of free and creative expression. I acknowledge that it is difficult to care for an archive. I acknowledge that it is difficult to make artwork. I acknowledge that those who make suggestions to an artist on how she might alter her artwork are attempting to collaborate with her as fellow artists. I acknowledge that a call to censor an artwork by destruction or through social or political pressure reflects an attempt to return to the status quo that which the appearance of the artwork has disturbed. I acknowledge that the disturbance of the status quo is a function of the artwork. I acknowledge that publishing an artwork is not an act of self-aggrandization, but one of great vulnerability. I acknowledge that artists put artworks and architects put buildings into the world to be engaged by others and that the greatest homage artists and the public can offer other artists is to engage with their work. I acknowledge that authorship and ownership are not synonymous. I acknowledge that once I publish, meaning make public, an artwork, it is no longer mine alone. I acknowledge that artworks are irrevocable transformations of the materials that have been used to make them. I acknowledge that physical proximity to the materiality of an artist's drawing is pedagogically very powerful in helping other artists, students, and researchers to understand the power they can wield when holding a pencil and drawing a line. I acknowledge that all artwork is additive. I acknowledge that it is impossible to control the narrative of the objects we create own or attempt to protect. I acknowledge that copyright can be used to control the discourse surrounding an artwork it is meant to protect. I acknowledge that copyright is not, quote, an inevitable, divine, or natural right that confers on authors the absolute ownership of their creations. It is designed rather to stimulate activity and progress in the arts for the intellectual enrichment of the public. End quote. I acknowledge the danger in privileging property rights to, agree, to a degree that could foster censorship. If the copyright holders of images are allowed absolute control over the context in which images are produced, they will also be granted a power of veto over criticism by being able to withhold the object of interpretation. I acknowledge that the proposal, the name of my artwork, is not a piece of jewelry, but an artwork whose form contains, among, among other materials, a diamond ring. I acknowledge that bodies, like legacies, are porous. I acknowledge that my Baragon archive is one of an infinite number of possible archives on the artist and architect Louis Baragon. I acknowledge that artwork is a gift. Thank you. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll be pretty short and sweet tonight, uh, or I hope I will be. Um, uh, I'm going to just, uh, you know, we started this project uh, long ago, and so uh, 
the work that ended up in the, the book that I'm going to speak to tonight is now four years old, and of course I've moved on. Uh, and, but I moved on in, in the case that the work has been received. You know I mean, it's the first time in my life I could talk about reception uh, in relation to the work, was, which was very multiple and kind of all over the place and uh, uh, outs outside the boundaries of which I imagined for the work. But I'm going to speak about a work called Malrose Shoes uh, that was uh, made or just finished at the tail end of 2012. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's on. All right. Um, no, that's a little better. I'll get deeper. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things uh, to say about this, but I'm going to, I'll, uh, we've got the picture here. Okay, I'm going to start with this photograph, and I'm going to read just a little something, and then I'm going to uh, cut to just a very short clip of the film. Probably too short to get any sense of it. But you know, it is what it is. I'm trying to stay within my seven minutes, okay. But I want to start with a little quote uh, that I added to the book uh, at the last minute. And it was something that I had in my notebooks. Uh, by two 2012, I became disillusioned uh, with notions of public space. You know, I, I, historically, I'm not a theorist in any way, shape, or form, but I've done some writing. And uh, I have a huge library and archive. And you know, you, I was getting sick of myself in some ways and I wanted to get a little bit closer to my sources, uh, um, which is, you know, I guess we all want to get closer to our sources, but it was, so the, the beginning of this project came quick and sudden, and, uh, but I want to start, this is uh, Andre Malraux standing in his uh, salon. It's a photograph from 1954, and I'll, and I'll read a little bit of, more about the uh, exact uh, context of that photograph. Uh, but Mel Rowe uh, said something in the late 40s. Uh, and it's, it's, when I first read it, it didn't strike me as intelligent at all. I thought, Jesus, it sounds like a, a kid writing or something. Uh, but he said, the man who loves what is created is superior to the man who has done the creating. Now that's the late 1940s. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's opening up a kind of larger uh, discourse and a change in uh, the history of the way we uh, view visionaries against uh, people that are part of more of our uh, postmodern canon, people that are using various kinds of appropriation and what have you. Uh, my sense was at that moment that there was something in Malraux, uh, and you know, again, when I when I say I'm not a I don't really write theory. I, I, I get obsessed with subject matter, okay? I think I ordered every book uh, in English that I could, I, there's a lot of books in French, of course, that I could get a hold of on Malraux, uh, and uh, studied them very, very closely. And then, of course, you, you get overloaded. You begin to get into the subject. You go through the subject. You become kind of Malraux. You abandon Malraux. You become yourself. You go somewhere else. But I wanted to start on that notion, some notion he had about public space and private space. Uh, and I'm not going to make a big theoretical claim around that. But uh, uh, I wish Philip Johnson had said that, maybe, in, in 1947. You see, fucking Philip Johnson. The problem with Philip Johnson is he was always apologizing for who he was. You know, he always felt that he was somewhere being uh, uh, overrun by uh, visionaries like Mies van der Rohe or uh, uh, Peter Eisenman or... Uh, Frank Gehry, the list goes on and on, and we would probably all agree he was, right? But he was on to something very early, right? The glass house is not an interesting, really, piece of architecture, but the transparency of it is to the degree that it, re it, it reveals a curatorial and a decorative kind of project, a sense of appropriation that nobody ever speaks about in Johnson enough. They do. They condemn him for it. But he was the front runner there, probably. Uh, along with Andre Malraux. Now, he doesn't have the kind of existential weight of Malraux, nor does he have the intellectual abilities of a Malraux, no, nor does he try to compete with people like Sartre. So he's on a different kind of uh, plane. But uh, I think Johnson may have been there first, and if he was not a dilettante in the way that he was, he probably could have brought on Venturi before he started copying Venturi. You see, he was the one that was there. He was in the postmodern project in the late 40s after the war. That's for sure. Uh, anyway, I don't know why I'm going into Johnson. I just thought of that tonight before I got here. Because, uh, and I'm glad you were talking about glass, broken glass. Uh, it's a different kind of broken glass, maybe. But okay, so um, 
And by the way, Malraux said that on a train. He said it on a train going from Paris to Vienna. Now, I thought the statement was stupid. Uh, but look, when you're on a train from Paris to Vienna, you're going from the world of the Flaneur to the world of Freud and psychoanalysis. That's an important route. And I think I've done it before. Uh, it's, on that kind of a route, you could fall in love. You could, you could create something powerful. And I think he had a kind of an epiphany there, OK? Somewhere he had an epiphany. OK, so we'll, uh, let's, let's cut back now to, uh, you know, this is written by me in a very simple way, just to describe the process of, uh, of Malraux's shoes, uh, and maybe it'll put, it'll, it'll put this piece a little bit in context. Anyway, um, I also, maybe before I wanted to start, I said, a lot has been published now on Malraux's shoes. I'm kind of sick of it in some ways. But what was lovely about this book is that I published the full text on it, okay? And that text came to me in fits and starts and fits over one summer. I don't really remember writing it now. Uh, it was a little, I know I'm sounding romantic, right? I don't give a shit, okay? I just don't give a shit. It was a very romantic project, okay? Uh, okay, Malraux's Shoes is based on a photograph of Andre Malraux, uh, the French writer, adventurer, resistance fighter, cultural provocateur, art theorist, orator, statesman, and France's first minister of culture a post he held from 1958 to 1969 uh, under the presidency of Charles de Gaulle. Now, I don't want to say that he was running Paris, but he, he was close to running it, okay? De, de Gaulle trusted him with just about everything, including meeting people like Mao and Castro, what, uh, how uh, de Gaulle often could not perform in public. Um, uh, Malraux was one of the figures of the 20th century that invented publicity as we know it. Uh, long before Rem Koolhaas and these other people stepped up to the plate and began coupling, you know, books with their work and these fantastic things. Uh, he knew how to do that. He was one of the first. So was Cord was on that, uh, on that early page as well. We could go on. You know all that, right? Okay, there's architects here. Anyway, this photograph, uh, this photograph was taken in 1954 in Malraux's Paris Salon for an article published in Perry Match the same year. Styled as a publicity photograph, Malraux is shown standing with a, uh, with a selection of plates from his trilogy of books, the imaginary museum of world sculpture lying at his feet before him. Um, notice the, the, the plates are, are facing us. It's totally a publicity photo. It's, it's made for us. He's not there in his, uh, he's not there staring at those things. He's not in a contemplative zone. Uh, uh, Corbusier would have uh, uh, loved this photo somehow. He was, doing, you know, he could have done something like this. Uh, but this, okay, let's go on. Um, uh, a clipping of this photograph, clipping, hung in my studio. Uh, this this clipping uh, has become, an, which became this clipping has become an uh, icon of post-war cultural history. We see it everywhere, and yet it's often not referred to in the text that describe it. The dates are mismatched. It's become a kind of evocative image of that period between the 40s and 50s. In fact, it's often dated in the late 40s, but it's in fact it's a, a, a photograph from the, uh, the mid 1950s. Anyway, it hung in my studios for many years as a primal source for my own archival obsessions. Okay, so I looked at that fucking thing every day, and I thought that's me. Okay, that's me, and I love I, you know, that's kind of how I work and how I think, uh, and. Um, Although I'm, I don't really posture like that. Okay. <laughs> so, in the spring of 2012, I stepped into the shoes of Andre Malraux, adopting and expanding her, his persona in order to perform an extended rant, part improvised, part scripted, as I stood, sat, danced, and crawled on the photographic plates, arranged exactly as in the original photograph. Given Malraux's megalomania, Tourette syndrome, alcohol addiction and private obsessions, he was an ideal stand-in for my own impatience and anxiety about the art and culture of my own generation. The resulting work, Malraux's Shoes, took the form of a 43-minute video. I had myself, I went to a makeup artist, I don't know anything about Hollywood or any of that, I had my hair dyed. Uh, I bought a beautiful suit, maybe I paid $5,000 for it. Uh, I mean, I went for it, okay? Malraux was one of the, was one of the best dressed uh, figures there was at that time. Uh, and I, even the day my wife walked in and I was on the set, we shot this out in, uh, God, what's, what's the name of that place out in Staten Island, that famous, uh, well, hell, I can't remember. 
it's the place, uh, I think Melville was there uh, uh, during the time he imagined uh, uh, Moby Dick. Snug, Snug, Snug Harbor. Yeah. It's Snug Harbor. And I picked that place because I could get the camera sign and had an old floor. Um, uh, anyway, why am I going there to that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there was something about that place, though, that spoke to me. Oh, I know where I was going. Uh, what was good is my wife came out, my wife and daughter who are here tonight, they came out and uh, they saw me in uniform that night and they, uh, they were shocked. I think they were repulsed a little bit. Uh, I mean, I looked gnarly anyway, but I looked, I looked dressed up gnarly. Anyway, so anyway, okay, let's uh, cut to Malraux now. Since his arrest at age 21 by French Cambo uh, Cambodian authorities for stealing bottle release from a Kumar temple, Malraux was driven by an obsessive sampling of visual art from diverse cultures. For Malraux, this sampling became a means of laying claim to the very possibility of art's transcendent value. Over the last 40 years of his life, Malraux would assemble, disassemble, and reassemble montages of photographic reproductions of art objects to create his imaginary museum, which ranks as one of the 20th century's exemplary uh, uh, manifestations of the archive along with the Atlas projects of Abby Warburg, Hannah Darbovan, and Gerhard Richter, to name only a few. Uh, and I realize now that I'm, I, I've named those three, I, I believe they're all German, and he's French. Where are we going with that, I don't know. I, I just observed it, maybe. Okay, Malraux's idea of an imaginary museum, a museum without walls, which he first announced in 1947, is a prophetic manifesto of the digital age that privileges the ubiquity of the photographic image over the physical art object and its, mu and its museum context. Through collated displays of reproductions in book form, the implication of this gesture anticipated the postmodernist shift towards appropriation, archiving, and curation, uh, and curation as artistic methods. Uh, Part of my ongoing project uh, from piece to piece over the last 20 years is to be is, is to try to attempt to locate kind of primal scenes rather than doing a kind of McLuhan-esque thing where you know McLuhan is always waiting around for the, the medium to uh, reinvent the message somehow. Uh, I still believe in a very old-fashioned way that visionaries were probably sensing those things long and not you know by the time uh, Malraux was organizing these photographs on the floor, photography had already already been around 100 years. Okay. He didn't need the birth of something to come along to make that transformation. Uh, he was channeling those things. Uh, even though he, he's a real son of a bitch, I, I really don't like the figure very much. He represents some kind of old male world uh, that I feel very disconnected to. Although, stri strangely enough, when I got into his place and his position, uh, I, I, it was easy to step back into that a little bit. And you know, maybe in that moment, I was culti cultivating something very autobiographical. The script for the work um, came a little bit from my notebooks uh, and improvis improvisation on the set. Uh, uh, the drinking that took place in the movie uh, was authentic uh, and the outbursts were relatively authentic. Uh, the interior monologues were uh, scripted in such a way that they were uh, they're more poetic and more, uh, you know, from my notebooks, the things you do in bed, you know, quiet, silent, private things more. So uh, anyway, we'll look now just at a, only a minute and a half of that, okay? The beginning. Oh, do I do that now? No, Mark's doing it. Okay. Sure, it's up though, Max. Give it some full weight. <laughs> Finally, people will understand that my rage is connected to its fucking silence. Fuck, I shit. God damn it. I should have seen it coming when one of my provincial curators was discovered with blood on her hands, but no traces were found on the artifacts. There was a beautiful disconnect 
that I first imagined as style, but that I now know was a sign of the total eclipse of history. I can no longer tell a photograph of an ancient Greek bas relief from a satellite image of Zuccotti Park, pitted stone from digital bits. Time and place are up for grabs. I'm back on the floor of the Khmer Forest in Cambodia, listening through the fog in my throat. <coughs> then suddenly, princely and alone. That's just the walk on. Yeah. We can find the other 41 minutes on female. Oh, really? Yes, yeah. it's there. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and it's a very dense text. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> going now? So I'm showing videos. So I know there's, um, I think, are you guys able to see the screens at all? Um, do you want to try and make friends up closer or come? <laughs> the floor is pretty warm. Yeah. <laughs> come cuddle. Eva, do you want to sign? No. Switch. Switch. Sign. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did that. <coughs> And then can you can you guys see here? Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm um, talking about a project called Video Sync Uganda. And it's evolution, and it's a project that I am doing in collaboration with my friend Paul Felzone, who's a media ethnographer in Uganda who can't be here tonight. Um, so he is a, he works as a, uh, he produces these P PSAs, public service announcements, on video that are about issues like public health or um, human rights issues. And I was asking him uh, about how he gets, how he's distributing them, and he was explaining that he distributes them on um, these pirated bootleg DVDs so that they play as previews to the main features film. So before you see Terminator 2, you see a two minute PSA about a health, you know, a public, public health issue, for example. And then they get distributed through this bootleg economy and they get played in um, the Bonda, which are these video halls where people communally go and watch these videos. And then um, when you walk inside, there's a few screens that you watch, two or three screens. So there might be um, the soccer game, there might be the feature film, there might be porn or cartoons. And um, previously, and then the, the sound is piped out to the local neighborhood. Wow. Um, and it's mostly men and boys who go into these spaces because the women have kids and they're doing household chores and so forth. Um, and so to me, this is really fascinating. This is, here's the outside and you know how it's advertised. And so um, that he was described. This is in Uganda. Um, so he was describing that when the pirated DVDs come into Kampala. The, into the capital, they get translated by what's called VJ, who um, in the 90s and the 2000s, they would translate live um, into the local language, and they become the new superstars where people go to see VJ Junior, VJ Emmy, and their translation of Terminator 2, and he, they get these new niches. It's this whole other layer of superstar or this, this different kind of media ecology that I thought was really fascinating. And now what they do is they, um, they to record themselves dubbing. So here's a sample of what that looks like. 
Haya haya wasokomi ni jako mwilieku Yazenda So this is the clip well, that you yeah, use yeah, yeah, to yeah. turn the circuit on and off. Yeah. This back six times. Told you, Mr. Mike is not. Yes. <laughs> so um, they play all the voices, and then um, what's interesting is how the different DJs interpret the same film, for example. So um, I was asking him about what, what, what kinds of film they show there, and he said it was Hollywood, Nollywood, Bollywood, and horror, and there's not really any local voices, nor they're highly commercial films. And so, um, Paul and I collaborated with the VJs there, a group of VJs, and I curated on, I curated the works of seven African diasporan filmmakers and artists, and we slipped or slinked them onto, because they placed previews to the main feature film, and I chose the one, I chose videos that don't rely singularly on language to communicate, so they're very, they rely on imagery. Um, so that it would invite the VJs who then translate it into local languages. Um, can you turn it up? in different places, the slinked videos. Um, and I think what I'm interested in, in doing is interfacing the informal economy and informal and formal economy. So for example, we show this in Art Brussels and we were in the nonprofit section. Strangely, we weren't allowed to sell the slinked videos, so we just announced that they were sold out before the before the group. Um, so I was received this grant to do a follow-up project, which I was a, just put in the grant. It was, you know, my friend encouraged me. I was like, okay, no one's gonna, no one's gonna support it again. It's about this blue lady economy. But I got the grant. What I had said in it was that this time I would collaborate with the VJs and we would, I would create something that was 
myself in collaboration with them. And I wasn't sure then, it took me like a, 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 a year and a half to figure out exactly what I was gonna do, and I started looking through the photographs of the video halls, and I noticed that there was a lot of imagery of, um, there's a lot of figure, a action figures, but in particular of Bruce Lee. And so I asked Paul what the deal was, and he was explaining that um, Ugandans love action films so much, and you know, Bruce Lee is such an icon, that what you do if you're a video hall, even in the middle of sticks, is that you put an image of Bruce Lee on the door, and people know that you're a video hall when they come in. So um, I was reflecting on, I'm Chinese and Ecuadorian, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and for me, um, Bruce Lee reframed how I saw my own family and was an important figure. And so then I started looking into it, and this is a video where I'm thinking through the process, this process, of Bruce Lee as a lingua franca. that transcends past, present, and future, um, and thinking about how Ugandans embrace him as much as we did here in America in the 80s, for example. Um, I've been thinking through, so now I'm at the point in this project where it's a work in progress that I'm sharing with you. This is um, a Bruce Lee transmission station that's sending signals to the past, present, and future. Um, and I'm, what I was doing here was I know that when I go to Uganda, um, I was having a conversation about what materials are available we're essentially renting out a video hall and we're gonna create artwork with folks there and also with the DJs and the there. So here is a transmission station where I'm playing around with the basic building blocks or building the vocabulary that will then adapt there. Um, a different version of it. And this is the, the latest iteration. This is the latest transmission station. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I, I go through the this idea of uh, of the infor informality of what uh, Eva proposing and Carlos of the idea of cabaret. Then actually, when I hear that, I say, "Oh my goodness, <laughs> what is going on here?" Um, it's good. I think it's in a way in in this time than than uh, people like. Uh, Fassbinder or Marlene Dietrich, we have uh, Jill Maggit or Dennis Adams here, that it could be part of, the, of a new way of bringing other kind of ideas. Um, 
I think it's important to consider <laughs> everything is falling apart. <laughs> then, <laughs> then the, um, if we talk about public, I think for me it comes immediately context and um, the context of here. I feel bring me definitely to Vito Conchi, as Eva mentioned in the beginning. Vito was one of the first people I meet when I arrived to New York in 1971. Um, he was very generous, very open. He was a decade very actually generous, if we compare with now. Uh, everybody arrives here from many parts of the world. It was very welcome. I don't think now so much. <laughs> but the story is that, that uh, I remember always with his green army jacket and his uh, kind of a smile. I think is I don't know if we could call a smile, but it has a kind of gesture. You probably, Dennis, you are a very good performer. You could. Uh, get that of what uh, it was great yeah, sure. yeah absolutely. very special um, I remember I also traveled with him in Italy and of course in Italy everybody think he's Italian Vito Acconci sure. and everybody started to talk with him in Italian and, <laughs> you know, he smiled and I think the idea of a smile I think is something important in relation with public space and public car because it's always this idea of negotiation where you need to deal with with public works. Jill, I think it was the, you work you are you are working on I think it's plain. I mean it's all about negotiation. And um, I think the another anecdote about this uh, traveling in in situations for public uh, sites and look uh, for possible situation to do work. I remember with uh, Kabakov. Uh, Kabakov, he only speak Russian. And uh, we traveled to South Spain in Sevilla and they invite us to see a site for a possible work on the 1992 fair. And they invite us at the moment the La Fiesta del Rocío. La Fiesta del Rocío is a popular feast in Spain where you have all the horses and cows moving for a peregrination for a religious thing. I always remember Kavakov seeing the possible site for a work. Yes. They don't understand anything. You know, it was impossible to grab anything about the context. I think the absurdity and, and, and surrealist that was invited to a site-specific visit to a place where it was something like that happening. And again, the smile. The smile of Kavakov, I think, is one of the good uh, contribution to their world. Anyway, I was just wanted to specifically address this to, to Vito. I don't think I want to show the tape I was thinking, Alpha Bill. I think it will be too long now. And also the conditions, the context. And I think it makes the Dambito created that situation impossible. You know? <laughs> I think it's part of his uh, kind of way of perceiving and uh, understanding. And uh, I think uh, when we come to a storefront, always Bito's present. And because I don't think I will come when you do the celebration for him, I think this is my contribution. Um, we 
we're hoping with this event to carry in a few of the, the contributors to the book and also add some new uh, voices and presences. So thank you very much to Marissa John for, for joining us, Jill Maggid, Alan Ruiz, and also uh, Bibi, thank you for, uh, for starting this off. Where's, where's Christina? She's still with us? Oh, she left. OK. Let me listen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just as a point of protocol, uh, there, there is a bar over there. It seems impossible for you all to get to. I'm sorry, I just wanted to say for the record, there is a bar there. Um, and it's kind of impossible, I think, at this point to moderate much of a discussion. But um, if anyone wants to sort of jump in with a question or two uh, for the uh, contributors, that would be most welcome. Otherwise, I don't know, we could just mingle now, because really we have seriously had 15 minutes. I mean, Eva, I don't know if, do we have, can we like linger beyond that? If you buy me a drink, <laughs> if, you, if you buy me some of the free drinks, for okay. sure. <laughs> we'll buy the story you to, uh, to the we can, we can hang out sure. until, uh, sure. I think um, it is fantastic. But I, I, I will, I will, have, I will pass the mic to whoever, whoever wants to engage. <laughs> Julie, you don't want to ask a, a, you don't want to make a challenging ritual there to call this this on you. Um, I, I love Colby's writing on me. Like, <laughs> uh, so, no, I just want you to publish it as many times as you can. <laughs> it's so insightful. No, Colby, like everything, like you just saw, has a very good way with words. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> <laughs> if, I mean, what I think was very interesting from <laughs> under the pebbles, the pipes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So from under the pebbles, the pipes. Um, in a time in which infrastructure has been used as a way to bring <coughs> politics into something that is highly needed, and if we don't have the beach anymore, in which these beaches are being privatized and shorelines are being changed and red line, um, to different ways in which we are looking into the technologies, the global technologies of distribution, um, or how old images remind us of the new technologies and the new forms of actually accessing information and producing new forms of collectivity. Um, it was, in, there was this moment in which when we started talking about the projection of the self and, and then suddenly like the broken window was an act of activism that it is so iconic that maybe it has become uh, already obsolete. And what kind of spaces do we have left to act uh, politically uh, uh, in the defense of sometimes of publics that might not be obvious or that might not be apparent until one encounters the impossibility of engaging with them? I think one of the very big questions that we have, and, and it is in the in the cover and in in the in this book, is is what is that that we mean by public? That we mean by space? And what kind of other terminologies and and the spaces we need to find and discover in order to keep on pushing so that we are not confronted and blinded by the same question that we are posing. And so it's more of a kind of commentary and summing up how all these different presentations come together to into the book and, and, and to also into the legacy of Montadas within MIT's uh, uh, program and, and where the program is moving forward, that, that the task that we all have as a, as a generation is to really articulate um, the contested sites in which those terms were discussed in the past, how much they are, in fact, maybe bourgeoisie terms in which um, we need to start questioning if even this facade is the new glass and, and if the cultural space or the cultural spaces that so-called are happening somewhere in some islands right now are the places in which we should be fighting uh, some of the ideas that, that we want to defend. But unless someone wants to really make another summary of the entire talk or has some <laughs> questions, um, I would definitely uh, invite us to buy uh, the books. We have very few of them. Um, I would also invite you all to come back on May 9th for an event that we are having on syntax and agency and how new forms of computational uh, urbanism are, and governance are really uh, driving the image of the city and really redefining what we think might be public. <coughs> and has to do, of course, with Control Syntax Zero, this exhibition that is above your heads, literally and metaphorically. And I also invite you all
to come on May 23rd to our annual celebration um, of, of our community as part of our uh, benefit that this year talks about artifacts and the art of really understanding the facts that constitute a certain approximation of truth in a time in which both art, culture, and, and our public sphere is being contested and disrupted. So with that said, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you for organizing this event. Congratulations, Montadas, uh, again. As I always say, there one never uh, like end up leaving a place. Um, and I think this book and this book lunch is definitely one of those. And I uh, thank you for really uh, uh, being part of Storefront tonight. Thank you, everyone.